Hello, everybody. My name is Kostis Geropoulos. I'm the energy editor for the Brussels-based New Europe newspaper. Um, thanks for joining our session. We have a very interesting uh, discussion today uh, on, uh, dis on regarding um, the future of aviation and shipping fuels. Um, as you know, the green fuels are the fuels of the future and um, in line with the EU policy for um, li li leading to uh, the EU e Green Deal and uh, carbon-free um, uh, society by 2050. Um, we have a lot of companies and a lot of uh, uh, have been discussing dif the different options for uh, a low carbon transport. Um, there, there's been a lot of breakthroughs with hydrogen, and there's going to there's also um, it, it's going to change the way we see uh, transport today. Um, I'm going to start uh, today uh, the discussion with uh, Dimitrios uh, Fafalios. He's the president director of Fafalios Shipping and the chairman of Marine Time Safety, Marine Time Environment Protection uh, of the Union of Greek Ship Owners. Um, Dimitrios, if you want to take the floor and uh, start with your presentation, thanks. Kosti, thank you very much. Uh, Minister, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I would like to thank e IENE for the honor of making this short presentation. As the debate around decarbonization and green fuels continues, you often hear shipping and aviation being lumped together and labeled as the two most hard to abate industries. While this may be true, the comparison between these two sectors can be deceiving. While both industries rely on mobile assets to transport goods and passengers around the world, shipping is a broad term that covers an industry that is considerably more diverse and complex than aviation. Consider this, ship types vary greatly from tankers, bulk carriers, container vessels, row rows, chemical tankers, to cruise ships, ferries, offshore vessels, LNG carriers, LPG carriers, and many more. Ship size ranges from small offshore supply vessels to huge liquid and dry bulk carriers. And the, the business model is very different. The modus operandi is very, very different. On the one hand, there is bulk tramp shipping, which is by far the most important segment carrying 84% of total ton miles in cargo, and one in which Greek ship owners specialize. It's dominated by thousands of small, privately owned shipping companies, specializing in the transportation of staples such as grain, iron ore, coal, oil, and oil products. Ship owners routinely hire out their vessels to charterers, who, depending on the type of contract, take over the commercial operation of the vessel. This can be likened to a hire a truck with a driver service. It's a segment that is by its very nature itinerant. On the other hand, liner shipping is a segment specializing in the transportation of containers, passengers, vehicles. It is dominated by a handful of public, publicly listed big multinational corporations. Ship owners are often the ones operating the vessels commercially. The trading patterns are characterized by regularity and, pre and predictability, and the segment can be compared to a bus or a train service. Overall, despite its crucial contribution to the world economy as the backbone of world trade, shipping is responsible for only 2 to 3% of world CO2 emissions, according to the International Maritime Organization, IMO, or the International Energy a Agency, IEA. But just as other sectors of the economy are transitioning to a greener future, so too must shipping take steps to reduce its emissions and eventually decarbonize. This raises the question, questions of how and at what level ship air emissions can and should be regulated. Shipping is truly global, is a truly global industry, and that requires global rules. And the UN IMO, the shipping industry's global regulator is the only one that can guarantee a global level playing field and provide the right framework for effectively reducing the industry's carbon footprint without having an impact on trade, the global economy, 
citizens' welfare, or the industry itself. The UNIMO has for years led the carbonization effort, starting with the Energy Efficiency Design Index in 2011. And this was the first globally binding climate measure since the Kyoto Protocol. In 2018, the UNIMO reached a historic agreement according to which greenhouse gas emissions from shipping are to be reduced by at least 50% by 2050 compared to 2008, despite the fact that the world population and global trade is expected to continue increasing for the foreseeable future. Today, today the IMO is well on course to deliver. In fact, last November, the IMO approved a well-balanced package of technical and operational short-term measures ap applicable to existing ships called the so-called EEXI, which is EEDI for existing ships. However, in recent years, the EU has claimed an ever-increasing role in the regulation of ship air emissions. The von der Leyen Commission has made the EU Green Deal a top priority and has several legislative initiatives in the pipeline. The most notable one is the European Commission's intention to include shipping in the emission trading system, the EU's carbon market. The, the Commission is also working on its so-called fuel EU maritime proposal to introduce a fuel standard for ships, a zero emissions EU berth standard where possible, and an efficiency credit market on top of and separate from the EU ETS. And without going into details for either of these initiatives, there are some general observations. By attempting to regulate the shipping industry at regional level, the EU risks undermining the considerable work and ongoing efforts at the UNIMO. As a result, other regions and countries might also be tempted to introduce local rules. This would be extremely detrimental to an industry as inherently global as shipping. There is a severe risk of market distortion uh, between, but also within the segments of the shipping industry. And these measures will increase tensions with the EU's trading partners and increase the risk of retaliation against the EU shipping industry, which controls around 40% of the global fleet. Regional regulation jeopardizes the EU's role as a global transshipment hub, which will lead to carbon leakage and eventually to loss of employment. But more importantly, these measures put the cart before the horse. Shipping is already the most energy efficient transport mode by far. More specifically, tramp bulk shipping is highly efficient, sailing at low speeds and having made huge strides in efficiency and thereby fuel efficiency and thereby uh, greenhouse gas reduction. Tramp bulk shipping is almost entirely powered by a two stroke slow speed diesel engine directly coupled to the ship propeller. This propulsion package is considered to be one of the most efficient on earth. In other words, energy efficiency can only go so far. We are reaching the limits of the current technological paradigm. To decarbonize, shipping will require new zero or low emission fuels that are safe and globally available. Such fuels do not yet exist and will require substantial investments in research and development from oil companies, energy providers, engine manufacturers, as well as investments in infrastructure development. Until then, shipping will remain largely carbon cap captive and any market-based mechanism or carbon intensity target focusing on ship owners would be little more than a punitive measure or a revenue generating mechanism. So what does the future of marine fuels look like? For one, the new fuels will be pricier as the processes to produce and distribute them are inherently more expensive. Shipping will have to compete for the use of these fuels with other modes of transport, such as aviation, trucking, and rail. Another thing that is becoming clear is that none of the candidate new fuels is as safe, energy dense, easy to transport, store, and handle as fuel oil or very low sulfur fuel oil. In most cases, there are several drawbacks that require considerable compromises. As a result, shipping may be heading towards a multi-fuel future. The one-size-fits-all fuels are on their way out. 
But even with government help, it may take decades before zero emission vessels and the necessary global infrastructure are ready. To reduce emissions in the nearer term, shipping needs other options. And the alternate fuels in the technology list is extensive. Biofuels, methanol, ammonia, hydrogen, LNG, and carbon capture and storage. But which of these fuels would not only make emissions from shipping more sustainable, but importantly would also make the best use of the extraordinarily efficient engine propeller combination, which would permit existing ships crews to continue without extensive retraining. Seen from these perspectives, drop in green liquid fuels, that, that's fuels that can be used in existing engines without major modifications are the most effective way forward, forward at this point in time. And, and a few front runners have recently emerged, sustainable biofuels, methanol, and electrofuels. If we look at the sustainable biofuels, the advantage are that it's a drop-in fuel, it can be used with existing engines, no capital ex expenditure would be needed. They can be blended with existing fuels. They are carbon neutral, so no additional CO2 is released to the atmosphere, and existing distribution networks can be used. Second and third generation biofuels, in fact, even third and fourth generation, hopefully, show the most promise for marine propulsion. The disadvantages, they're more expensive than their fossil fuel counterparts. The market is immature. There's limited distribution and availability. And further modifications and regulations are needed at the IMO uh, and the ISO, International Standards Organization, level. Next, we come to methanol. Methanol, again, is a drop-in fuel. It can be used in existing engines. It's easy to store and handle. There's no uh, sulfur dioxide, limited nitrogen oxide, and particulate matter emissions. Storing it on board is cheaper than other options, such as LNG. The disadvantages are that it only reduces CO2 by about 25%. And the corrosive nature of methanol means that expensive stainless steel or equivalent materials are necessary for onboard storage and distribution systems. It's also toxic when inhaled and handling needs particular uh, attention. Therefore, safety concerns come up. It's flammable and explosive. Again, safety concerns. Methanol bunkering infrastructure is currently centered only around methanol terminals. And the lower energy density of methanol, substantially lower than fuel oil, and increased costs of the fuel storage system continue, continue to make this fuel less attractive for the tramp bulk fleet. We come on to electrofuels. Electrofuels based on green hydrogen, electrolyzing water with renewable electricity that can be synthesized with nitrogen or non-fossil uh, carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide from carbon capture systems to create green liquid fuels. In effect, e-methanol. Though information is readily available on the likely cost of these electrofuels as drop-in fuels, which are currently at the very early stage of development, but they hold a lot of promise. And to conclude, going green may be the biggest challenge the industry has, our industry has ever faced. It demands the right investments and the right policies to support a range of technologies and fuels that do not yet exist. The greening of fuels is not and cannot be the responsibility of ship owners alone. The fuel of the future will need to be energy dense, safe, available in sufficient quantities worldwide to guarantee the smooth functioning of the shipping industry. Other actors must also be involved, engine manufacturers, equipment suppliers, shipyards, classification societies, ports, fuel suppliers, and charters. What is needed is a massive effort in research and development and shift of, techn of, of the technological paradigm towards safe and future-proof alternative fuels. And this is where the regulators come in. We're looking to the regulators to maintain the global level playing field that our industry depends on stimulate substantial investment in research and development on these green liquid fuels, incentivize investments in production, distribution, and availability in as many ports worldwide, introduce requirements at all levels of the maritime value chain and not only focus on regulating ship owners, preserve the highly efficient bulk tramp model, shipping model. These workhorses of the sea are not only the mainstay of the shipping industry, but also a pillar upon which our modern globalized economy is built. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Dimitrios, for this uh, very interesting presentation and uh, outlining what the future of maritime fuels will look like. Um, all these uh, issues regarding, you know, the greening of fuels and safety and efficiency um, are very important, as well as, you know, uh, how to compare the, um, it, you know, the how the competition between uh, maritime fuels versus aviation in tracking. Uh, uh, let's move to, and we'll take questions at the very end, but let's move to our next speaker and for, uh, for his presentation, George Pateras, he's the president of the Hellenic Chamber of Shipping. Uh, George, if you want to take the floor and uh, thanks. Kosti, thank you very much. Minister, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, the um, Institute of Energy of Southern Europe uh, for arranging this interesting, rather provocative um, seminar. Historically, the choice of fuel was a matter of convenience as opposed to efficiency of combustion or the environment. The British Empire controlled all the coaling stations over the entire globe or the known world, so coal was the fuel of choice. Then oil appeared. How convenient, high calorific value, more efficient com combustion and easier to store. It basically fits into any shape tank. At the turn of the previous century, horses were considered uh, polluters and petrol powered cars were a godsend. Fast forward to today. Oil is such a convenient fuel. With the help of the cartels and the elevated price of oil, it's made a lot of money for a lot of people. Sulfur is such a convenient and good lubricant for primary and secondary reciprocating parts. Convenient storage and high calorific value. But it does have a few drawbacks, apart from the obvious environmental pollution potential when spilt. We also have sulfur oxide, nitrous oxide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and black carbon. So we tweak our engines to produce carbon dioxide as opposed to monoxide and black carbon, for obvious reasons. We add a little bit of air to improve our combustion, so we get nitrous oxide, because 78% of air is nitrogen. It's too expensive to strip sulfur from the fuel during the refinery process, so now we just blend various uh, viscosities and hope for the best. So LNG appeared. No sulfur, not a long-chain hydrocarbon like oil, so more efficient combustion, but still CO2, carbon monoxide, carbon, and the dreaded methane, 78 times more potent than CO2. Let's say it's a good transitional fuel. Enough engineering. I'm sure you all know more than I know about um, fuel combustion. So let's get on to the project of the Hellenic Chamber of Shipping. Our project is the renewal of our ferry boat, ferry boat fleet here in Greece. Our ferry boat fleet issues 35 million tickets a year and transports 2.8 million cars and 10 million tons of cargo around our islands and mainland. These are the figures for 2019. Only the tourists were less in 2020 due to some pandemic. It's not only serves, it not only serves the majority of our island tourists, but predominantly 15% of the Greek population that resides and works on the islands. The connectivity of Greece is based on sea lanes as opposed to roads. We have 116 ferry boat destinations, 46 of which are public service offerings, Agones Grames. So you understand the importance of our ferry boat fleet to the economy of Greece. Our aim is to raise funds to the tune of 11 billion euros to renew our ferry boat fleet. Not only the four main systemic companies, but the small Porthmia, sea bridges, and the local inter-island inter community vessels, community-owned vessels. This is ostensibly done to meet the IMO decarbonization targets of 2030 and 2050, 2050. And of course, to protect the beautiful islands of Greece. Our studies have shown that the greenest solution is derived from an electric drive. The power management system for the electric drive will be the same for the entire life cycle of the vessel, say 40 years, 
and the power source will change as technology catches up with our expectations. We are currently working on a proof of concept project for carbon free ferry with the Greek government in conjunction with Motor Oil Elas. This proof of concept project has many advantages for our industry. Most importantly, our intention is to design, design and build a vessel for a traditional inter-island service using as many Greek recyclable and recycled products as possible. The intention is to build in Europe for Europe, if possible in Greece, as it is for Greece. Secondly, the financial mechanism for a fair distribution of funds will be tested and confirmed. The conceptual design was completed by the National Technological University of Athens, the Metsovia Polytechnio, which showed, as I mentioned before, basically an electric drive controlled by inverters, which can be good for the entire 40-year design life of the vessel. Incidentally, our proof of concept project vessel will have two main engines of about a thousand kilowatts each and probably at 680 volts. The main dilemma and the point of heated debate is the power source to generate ele the electricity to drive the propulsion plant and other vessels ancillary requirements. Obviously, as the name suggests, we need to do a non-carbon emitting fuel because it's called the non -zero, it's the zero carbon ferry project. This therefore ex excludes for us ultra low sulfur marine gas oil and LNG and only allows us the option of ammonia, methanol, hydrogen, or batteries charged by a renewable source of energy, or any other zero carbon fuel could be used provided it is commercially viable. Our current project is specifically not for short distances, sea bridges, Porthmia vessels, that our studies show should be fully electric with batteries, but we're looking for vessels for a larger distance and higher speed. So this is where motor oil comes in. They have a supply of blue hydrogen, a byproduct from their refineries, which we need to power our carbon-free vessel. Our issue is therefore not only the design and construction of the ferry boat, but also the design and construction for the required infrastructure to guarantee a reliable, sustainable, and suitable quantity of hydrogen on the islands. Currently, we do not have a supply of green hydrogen, but we will not, but this really won't affect our, our design. As I understand it, the production of hydrogen from seawater with coated electrodes using solar energy has gone beyond the proof of concept stage and is now being studied commercially. This is the practical side of greener fuels to be used for shipping. We have completed our initial commercial market research on the ferryboat fleet with the help of PricewaterhouseCooper. We have completed the market-based mechanism for funding, again with PricewaterhouseCooper, and the generic technical design concept was done by the National Technical University of Athens. And just last week, we have submitted to the government our proposal for the construction of a hydrogen-driven mid-range ferry boat together with a request for our business plan and for the hydrogen distribution infrastructure business plan for Motor Oil Elas. This is a, re a reality. It is not just a proposal or a dream. Therefore, energy providers must create sufficient, reliable, on-spec, carbon-free, sustainable fuels that we need to achieve, to achieve the regulatory targets set by the UN IMO. This is not the ship owner's sole responsibility. All sections of shipping must be involved, including engine manufacturers, charters, shippers, and receivers. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thanks, George. Um, very interesting presentation and um, the discussion of, uh, you know, for a low carbon ferry boat fleet in Greece and um, also um, giving us uh, an idea of the, about the practical side of fuels to be used in shipping and the importance of reliability and low carbon. Um, I'm, I'm going to move now to Aegean Airlines and uh, 
George uh, Govajizakis. Uh, he's the Network Planning and Direct Development Director and Aeronautical Engineer of um, Greece's uh, major airline, Aegean. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Geropoulos. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the uh, invitation by the Institute and to thank the organizing committee as well for the uh, opportunity to speak uh, uh, in this uh, virtual conference on behalf uh, of Aegean Airlines. Uh, minister, ladies and gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, I would like to start by saying just a few words on, uh, on Aegean uh, before we dive into the, uh, this really exciting topic that we're speaking about today. Uh, so what you see here is essentially a very uh, short uh, uh, path um, or, or description of 20 years of experience that the GN brings uh, to uh, this very important sector in Greece, starting in 1999 with the launch of scheduled flights, uh, moving on to through some important milestones in 2005 with the first large order to Airbus of uh, jet aircraft, uh, the 2013 Olympic air acquisition, and uh, culminating in uh, 2018 uh, with uh, a new larger order of uh, uh, even more fuel efficient aircraft to, uh, to Airbus. Um, so GM has been on a continuous growth path as you can also see here some of the uh, passenger figures. Uh, in 2019, we transported uh, approximately 15 million passengers, uh, both domestic and international, and steadily growing, uh, especially international traffic, steadily growing since 2008. Um, Aviation, much like shipping that Mr. Fafalios mentioned before, has been also growing at approximately a fairly constant uh, and contributing about 2% of the man-made carbon emissions uh, in the overall industry, as you see also in this pie chart. The sector itself has been growing at approximately 4% every year. So that's really your demand. That's, that's the growth that the sector sees, <coughs> excuse me. And if we are to look a bit in more detail as to where the focus is on those uh, emitting sources, um, here you can see that essentially two thirds of the CO2 emissions uh, come from the short and medium range uh, uh, aircraft flying approximately 2,000 to 3,000 kilometers. So just to give an idea, an Athens-London, for example, flight would be somewhere in this range, 2,300 kilometers. So that's where the main focus is really. If we are to start talking about decarbonization of aviation, we are talking about the shorter range, medium range aircraft, somewhere between 80 to 250 seats. Just to give a very simple example, uh, Aegean's uh, fleet today has aircraft between 180 to 220 seats. So in this range. However, you, you see also as the data indicates that medium and longer range aircraft, the ones that really fly long distances, over 8,000 kilometers is also an area where we need to focus. This is a very recent uh, uh, actually publication and something that we tend to see quite often in terms of the roadmap. I, I put this graph up and I kind of like it because it focuses on European aviation. I think the trend, the projections, the roadmap is very similar for uh, aviation, global aviation as well. So what we see here, and this is uh, what we will focus on today and how a GN actually will be, let's say, involved with these four mitigation pillars. We see that this decarbonization roadmap is essentially technological improvements, operational improvements, and we'll talk a little bit about that and what we do as a GN in that area. Sustainable aviation fuels, another interesting topic that we'll talk about, and then market-based measures, which is mostly offsetting, not only, but mostly carbon offsetting. 
And a quick note here is that in order to reach the net zero target in 2050, which is what we see here on this roadmap, uh, I think the interplay of these uh, four pillars will be important. The percentages you see here is an indication by uh, an initiative of the so-called Destination 2050 um, uh, forum that, that's, that's really the comprises of five important entities in aviation in Europe, including A4E, the European Regional Association, and so on. However, these percentages are just indicative. But these will actually vary in how we deploy these four mitigation pillars will actually be the key whether we can actually reach this uh, initiative, this uh, sorry, target uh, of net zero emissions in 2050. Uh, before we go to 2050, let's go back a year to, to 2019 and 2020. And uh, just a few words on, on, from my side on the impact of uh, COVID on uh, commercial traffic. Uh, the, what you see here is really what uh, airlines at the moment face, which is the reality of a 60% decline in uh, world total passengers in 2020. Uh, and on this graph, you'll also see previous major events starting in 1972, starting from the oil crisis and, and the behavior or the impact of these events on uh, the world passenger traffic evolution. And, and you see the severity of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In our industry, we tend to use a metric, which is really a metric of airline demand, so to speak, which is the revenue passenger kilometer. This is effectively, if we can fly a revenue passenger, how far can we take him for, let's say, if it's a kilometer, that's a revenue passenger kilometer. That's an interesting metric because what you see here is that the projection is that we don't see this demand recovering uh, until uh, to 19 levels, until 2024. This is a, an IATA projection. So that's uh, roughly three years out from now. And you can see the pre-COVID baseline forecast, uh, which is the dotted line, roughly speaking. Uh, this refers to the global RP, RP case, but I think the picture is similar in Europe. The picture is similar in the US. The picture is very similar, actually, all over the world. And what is the impact of the COVID-19 event on uh, aviation as far as emissions are concerned? Uh, well, they actually fell to the 1990 levels, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, this graph refers to international flights mainly, but the trend is similar uh, for um, domestic as well. Um, so what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, aviation uh, is uh, facing uh, uh, or, uh, let's say, uh, dealing with uh, something um, that's, um, that's here to stay? What, 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 where does all this lead, essentially? And, and, uh, and over the last year or two years or year and a half, but especially during the COVID uh, period, there have been a lot of discussions about the impact act of uh, this on aviation. And in all honesty, we read about it every day. Uh, airline survival is at stake at the moment. There are airlines out there that uh, uh, may not actually survive and uh, be there the next day. However, however, what has come out of this, uh, a year long debate uh, from the airline perspective is that the industry, the airline industry, uh, is committed to long-term carbon neutrality. This is the message we want to, uh, let's say, to, to pass today, that uh, the airline business has, uh, in the past, witnessed quite a few crises. And um, it's very likely that there will be more in the future. Uh, however, the industry has decided that um, it has to be resilient, it has to cope with it, and uh, when it does emerge, it has to be more efficient. 
And this is exactly what was also unveiled in the sustainability initiative that you see here, Destination 2050, a route to net zero European aviation. <coughs> Let's talk a little bit about the GN Airlines and how the four mitigation pillars that we used before, and we noted before, can be or are actually being utilized as we speak at the moment within the, the more global ESG framework of a GN. Uh, so just to refresh a bit our minds, technology improvements, fleet modernization, operational improvements, market-based measures, and sustainable aviation fuels. Let's start with technology improvements. Uh, um, very nice pictures here of uh, futuristic aircraft and technologies. Uh, and who knows, in the future, we may see also other disruptive technologies. What airlines tend to see at the moment, and I think what we want to go after, is the lower effort, so to speak, higher impact uh, opportunities that are out there. And this includes uh, the sustainable aviation fuel aircraft, new technologies or next generation turbine engines, uh, whether that's a turbine engine or the open rotor architecture, which is, uh, deals with particular, uh, let's say, needs in, in our sector. And the, the gas turbine is a very efficient machine. Uh, the gas turbine is uh, probably one of the most efficient uh, power generation units that we have available. And if we drop in the right fuel, uh, this may well give uh, a much uh, faster path to meeting the 2050 um, net uh, carbon neutral target. Because as you also note here, the timelines associated with some of the other technologies that, that are currently being researched, such as hydrogen aircraft, hybrid aircraft, even fully electric aircraft are quite a way out. Interesting to highlight here the approach by the two large OEMs, uh, which is Boeing uh, in the US and Airbus in Europe. Uh, Boeing has uh, made a public, uh, let's say, statement to support 100% use of sustainable aviation fuels in aircraft by 2030. Um, uh, Airbus recently um, praised the benefits of using hydrogen and has actually is also actually planning such a project for 2035 uh, plus. Uh, obviously, both OEMs are investing in all technologies. There is no magic bullet. There is no magic solution. And we will have to see where this takes us. In this context, as far as the GN is concerned, and as far as new aircraft are concerned, uh, very briefly, we placed an order for the new A320 new aircraft in 2018, up to 46 aircraft, plus some additional options, with a new GTF fuel efficient engine. We have already taken delivery even during this crisis of eight aircraft in 2020. For us, it's really a strategic imperative to operate a young and efficient fleet. It has always been a strategic imperative, uh, even well before uh, such sustainability efforts uh, became um, say more prominent. And we have seen this benefit of uh, almost 15% in fuel consumption per flight um, and uh, about 19 to 23% less emissions per passenger seat compared to previous generation Air Airbus that we also have currently in the fleet. The point is that uh, refleeting is, is a proven way and it's a measurable solution to curb emissions. On the other hand, it's a significant capital investment. And just noting here some uh, figures relevant to a GN, uh, whether it's in lease prices or market prices, it's a big number, it's a big investment. So here uh, we can see that overall, if we go back 20 years to a GN's first aircraft, this was the Avro RJ100 back in 1999. If all of you might remember that little jet with the four engines hanging under the wings. Uh, since then, uh, we are talking about approximately a 50%, 50 percent, 50 percent improvement in uh, emissions, 
which is mainly due to the engines, airframe improvements, as well as cabin densities. Uh, we carry more, or we are able to carry more people in the aircraft. This is over a 20 year period. Let's talk a little bit about the second pillar, which is operational improvements. Uh, yes, we would like to see, and we want to benefit, Aegean and all airlines want to benefit from the latest air traffic management improvements and initiatives being launched in Europe at the moment. Um, we have invested in um, route optimization and fleet planning uh, infrastructure uh, uh, in order to um, assist with an optimized flight path trajectory of the aircraft, taking into account emissions as well. And these are ranked, by the way, from, let's say, the higher impact to the lower impact categories. Operational procedures, uh, the taxing, that, that's the part where the aircraft is actually leaving the gate until it takes off, as well as the landing and takeoff phases are very penalizing in terms of CO2 emissions. So we try to work with airports and authorities in order to produce and, and approve and, and certify procedures that can help us reduce emissions during these critical phases of the flight. Reducing uh, APU usage. APU is essentially, in Aegean's case, a third small engine gas turbine that you carry on the aircraft that provides additional power. That's another small engine that you have on board. The less you use it, the better off you are for emissions. On-time performance, this is not only significant for the passenger, this is something that the GM takes very seriously. This is something that also directly affects the um, emissions profile of a flight. Uh, digital innovation is important. Uh, I note that because uh, we have taken initiatives over the last few years to digitize the cockpit, get rid of those old uh, Bible-sized big folders that some of you might remember <laughs> used by the crews and carried around in suitcases. That's additional weight, and that leads me to the next point. Weight minimization is important, and here I'm not referring to um, the technological weight improvements in terms of a lighter airframe or composite materials. I'm referring to minimizing the operating weight of the aircraft, uh, anything from water or material that you have on board, anything that has to do with uh, equipment when you actually select it during the design phase of the aircraft, that adds weight and every kilogram counts. Uh, aircraft maintenance practices are very important. So the maintenance of the airframe and the maintenance of the engine do have a lower impact, yet they do have an impact on emissions. And just a quick note here, and I think this is something that the other speakers may also, uh, and I think I heard this before from Mr. Pateras as well. You try to fix one thing, you break another. That's the reality. Uh, we, yes, we try to do things and we compete uh, with reducing CO2, but what about noise? What about the nitrous oxides that Mr. Pateras mentioned before? These are competing factors that I think all parties here are trying to, to cope with and deal with. Market-based measures, uh, Aegean uh, as well as Olympic Air as a subsidiary has been participating in the EU ETS trading scheme since its inception. So it's uh, more than nine or 10 years now, including the Swiss ETS because we do fly to, to Switzerland. Um, and we uh, recently started participating in the first phase of the ICAO Corsia mechanism. Uh, a quick note here, without going into deep detail analysis, uh, the two are, are different mechanisms. They have different monitor, uh, monitoring and reporting and verification requirements. They have a similar scope. They have uh, a different concept. One is a cap and trade scheme, one is using that CTS, the EU ETS. One is using a baseline. There's, there was much debate during 1920 on what that baseline going forward will be. I think we're still on a learning curve here, and we have to see how 
Corsia over the next few years will develop and how uh, all of the airlines are actually focused now in order to make it more relevant. I think that's the important point, to make it more relevant and um, use it as a stopgap measure. Uh, all of these market-based measures, to a large extent, I think airlines view them as a stopgap measure until we can actually find that magic bullet, so to speak, and carry on um, to, towards uh, carbon neutrality. And uh, the last but not least, I would say mitigation pillar is uh, sustainable aviation fuel. So just, I would like to also say a few words here from, from our side. I think many speakers uh, covered the majority of these topics here. Uh, I, I put them up more for completeness as opposed to going through each one in, in detail. Uh, obviously the cost of fuel versus the kind of Jet A1 uh, fuel that uh, airlines use is important. The economics here is probably more the hurdle than the technology or the scale. We heard from previous speakers in this forum today and yesterday that they can scale, they are, or they will be able to scale and, and provide um, the scaling infrastructure, scaled infrastructure that we need. But um, there is a need for a stable policy framework uh, the capital investments to get there are necessary. A GN, as well as I think all the airlines, are willing to support and accelerate research initiatives that uh, will be uh, undertaken. And I think the most important thing is that we live in an aviation ecosystem. So all the stakeholders have, to, and I think this was also noted before by Mr. Fafalios, have to work together in order to have this common goal that we're all trying to get to. Now, what are the some of the more practical challenges, so to speak, for airlines uh, that we're also looking at at the moment? The landscape is starting to change. So there is a momentum building up. Yet the sustainable aviation fuel case must make business sense. I think that's important. And we're, we're not there yet, but we have to build that. We have to build that business case. Uh, from the airline perspective, it's important to utilize the current assets as they are with no or minimum changes to these assets or to the engines of the aircraft. Um, it's a challenge, and this is what I mentioned before, the competition between modernization and sustainable aviation fuels, refleeting, so new aircraft versus fuels. It's a challenge for an airline to do both. It's a huge investment, it's a huge undertaking to say, yes, I will modernize my fleet and at the same time introduce a new sustainable uh, aviation fuel. Obviously, we have to deal with the limited availability at airports, the infrastructure associated with that, and the logistics that go with that. Uh, thorough testing throughout all flight phases. And as we all know, we also tend to face sometimes extraordinary situations. So this is something that we have to deal with and gain experience with that, as well as, last but not least, customer perception. We need to work with our customers and, 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 and communicate to them um, exactly how this um, new tool that we have in the toolbox will be utilized. Uh, so AGN is really building on the work done today. Uh, actually, there have been more than 2,000 flights uh, that have uh, taken place since 2011 using sustainable aviation fuels. We continue to investigate the use of uh, SAFs. In 2019, we launched an initiative with Athens International Airport and Hellenic Petroleum in order to look at the logistics of using SAF, particularly HEFA type of fuel at Athens Airport. Obviously, this has to do with the distribution, how you store the fuel, how will the fuel be then uh, taken into service onto the aircraft? 
And then it has taken a bit of time, but recently we also cleared uh, the uh, current aircraft that we have, the older generation first, uh, A320 that we have. And just recently we also cleared the A320 Neo, the new aircraft, in order to, or the engines of the new aircraft, in order to um, uh, get approval to use, let's say, SAF fuels. So from a GN side, there's an ongoing effort at the moment. Uh, it's a long, complicated process. It takes time. And we're trying to understand all these aspects and what are the implications for us of using uh, sustainable aviation fuel on the aircraft, eventually potentially leading to one of the first test flights. And then from that point on, of course, it will have to be a, a study, thorough analysis, and then to see how we go from there. Uh, so just um, a last point uh, before closing, as a closing remark, as I mentioned before, um, the airline business is um, used to dealing with crises um, and, and, and the, you never know when the next one will be. You never know the severity. Uh, but um, we are working in the background and um, towards coping with this crisis. And uh, the expectation is that um, after we cope with it, when we emerge, we really want to be there in terms of the sustainability efforts going on in the aviation ecosystem. We really want to be a very strong player in that environment and to emerge more efficient um, when we do come out of this situation, hopefully in the near future. So I want to thank you for your time and your uh, attention again. Thank you, Mr. Kovacidakis, uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And uh, I've, I've unfortunately, I haven't flown uh, with uh, the Airbus Neo yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to that. And also, um, you know, reiterating uh, the airline's uh, industry's commitment to long-term neutrality. Um, it also, I mean, the challenges that the aviation industry faces during the COVID-19 uh, crisis and uh, these are unprecedented, unprecedented times and citing all these figures. And I was impressed that we're actually going back to the levels of 1990. Um, and it would be interesting, but I'm sure that aviation will recover. Uh, moving to our next speaker, uh, Jonathan Wood, the, the Vice President from Europe ASPAC and Renewable Aviation at Neste. Uh, Jonathan, if you would like to um, take the floor. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here uh, on, the, on the, the hot topic of climate change and how we uh, can, um, in the aviation sector, uh, make progress towards reducing our emissions. It's, um, I think there's a lot of similarities between the marine sector and uh, the shipping sector and, uh, and aviation. And I think I would uh, certainly uh, agree with everything that um, George has just outlined from an Aegean point of view. And I think I will be able to build on that. Um, um, in, in this uh, short session uh, uh, that we'll go through right now. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, aviation like shipping is, is, is key to our global economy and society and it's making a very valuable contribution to um, both economically and, uh, and also in terms of cultural exchange. But we are, as uh, George has indicated, going through unprecedented times at the moment. However, as George also indicated, the industry is fully committed and all players in the industry are fully committed to um, making a difference and really making big changes to reduce emissions uh, as, as quickly as possible. There's no dilution of that commitment as a result of the COVID crisis we're facing. Uh, it is a hard to abate sector. Uh, shipping and aviation are certainly up there as some of the hardest to abate sectors. It is an international and global industry. So what we need to put in place in terms of policies need to, uh, as far as possible, avoid a distortion of competition. And safety, of course, is absolutely critical and under underlies everything. As we say, there's no parking lot in the sky. So we can't afford to make any mistakes here and any fuels or technologies that are deployed have to go through a very, very rigorous global approval process. So what I'll run through uh, in the next uh, few slides and the next 10 to 15 minutes is just a quick outline as to um, the availability and the sustainability of, of SAF. Then the affordability issue 
and the policy uh, choices we need to make. So the acronym ASAP, availability, sustainability, affordability, and policy. And then finally, an outlook uh, going, going forward. But first, just a few words about uh, Neste. Um, Neste as a company may not be familiar uh, to many of you. Uh, it is uh, a, by origin a Finnish company, um, a traditional oil and gas oil, oil, oil company refining and marketing fuels in the Nordic region. But in the last 20 years, we as a company have transformed ourselves to become the leader in the provision of renewable fuels for both road transportation and for aviation. And indeed, we are also building a renewable polymers and chemicals business. We're rated, therefore, in the Global Sustainability Index in the top three and have in the, in the year 2020 helped reduce the carbon emissions of our customers by 10 million tonnes. And this is a journey we're on. We have set ourselves a target by 2030 of doubling the carbon reduction that we will enable our customers to achieve. We're investing in R&D and we're investing in our production capacity. As you can see here, increasing our, uh, our production capability from 3 million to over four, four and a half million tons. These are investments that are underway as we speak um, and there'll be more to come. So we are making the commitment now. The business case that was referred to earlier makes certain assumptions, but we believe that we have to move in this direction as society. Our purpose as a company is to make the planet healthier for our children. And so we believe that society is also moving in this direction and will support us on this journey. I'll talk a little about, a bit about the case for change. So we all know um, that uh, post the Paris Agreement, we, we've got, uh, we, 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 we as a society, global society have committed ourselves to trying to controlled emissions to ensure that temp global temperature doesn't rise by more than one and a half degrees. What that means in effect is that we need to act now. The longer we wait or the longer we, uh, yeah, the longer it takes, the more severe the reduction in uh, carbon emissions is going to need to be in order to keep to this global warming uh, target that we have set ourselves. And as um, George indicated, in the aviation industry, there is a commitment to reduce emissions by 50% by 2050, compared with 2005. And that there are a number of um, um, tools that we wish to deploy, we need to deploy to achieve that, both new aircraft and uh, engine uh, technology, as well as SAF. I think it's clear that we can't afford to bet on one. We need to deploy all of these solutions. And many reports recently issued, including that that George referred to that was issued literally just this week, reinforce the commitment of the industry uh, and also uh, confirm the, the, the achievability and the feasibility of, of that carbon reduction, that greenhouse gas emission reduction, and the role that SAF has uh, to, to play in that. So I said, let's talk a little bit about the sustainability of SAF. So as was mentioned, we, the, 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 the easier it is to deploy as a drop-in solution with the existing infrastructure, I think this was mentioned by our shipping colleagues earlier, the better, the more easily deployed it is. The great thing about sustainable aviation fuel is that there are multiple ways of manufacturing it but also that it is a drop-in solution with the exist that can be used in the existing aircraft and the existing air air airport infrastructure. Its performance is um, entirely comparable with the traditional fossil jet or kerosene fuel. It's made from renewable wastes and residues today, and we can see the potential to expand the, the uh, renewable feedstocks, bio-based materials, so that we can see the pathway to increasing supply in the future and it is actually commercially available in North America, in Europe and even in Asia now. This 
SAF that we are producing and indeed others are producing is delivering an 80% reduction in end-to-end -end emissions versus the fossil fuel alternative. And furthermore, it is delivering additional non-CO2 benefits in terms of reduced particulate emissions, reduced uh, contrail and SOX emissions, and indeed even improved fuel efficiency. So it's really a, an economic um, uh, benefit in both uh, from reduced emissions, but also from improved efficiency. And in terms of availability, as I mentioned, it is now available in all regions of the world. Here we've got a map of the customers that Neste's product has been supplied to in the last uh, couple of the years. Europe has probably been leading the way alongside uh, actually in the US, California with some very uh, helpful uh, regulatory um, support. But indeed also now uh, it's been supplied in, into Japan. So it's being deployed both in the commercial airline sector as well as also in, in, in the smaller business aviation aircraft sector. And we're, we as Neste are very conscious that we need to ramp up the supply and availability as quickly as possible and so are, are working with partners, distributors and, and the like to ensure that it is available wherever there is firm demand for it. So in effect, the shop is open. We're ready to do business and we're not the only company that's now investing to increase the supply. So the major issue, as was mentioned by George, is the economics of, 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 of this. It does cost more to produce. And here you can see a map of some of the policies that are being developed or implemented uh, by governments around the world. Clearly we want, as far as possible, for there to be consistent uh, global and regional policy. And as the international ICAO organization is certainly promoting that. But within uh, Europe and the US, there have already been major steps forward. Fundamentally, we have regulatory support that can help us both on the demand side and on the supply side. And I'm a big believer in um, the fact that demand should lead. And here we can see two particular types of policy which are helping us. One is the so-called uh, SAF blending mandate, requiring a certain proportion of all fuel to be, to be uh, SAF. In this case, in Scandinavia, in Norway, that's already been started. Sweden has announced it will introduce a blending mandate uh, of 1% this year. And France has in, indeed also announced they will require a certain proportion of all fuel to be SAF from 2022 onwards and other countries and indeed the whole of the EU are considering in implementing such a SAF mandate in, in the very near future. The second type of demand policy which is linked with the so-called renewable energy directive or RED2 um, is, is the, is the uh, introduction of incentives to help bridge the gap between uh, or help promote the use of SAF by enabling um, incentives to help bridge the gap between the cost and price of SAF versus the currently used fossil jet fuel. And the Netherlands and the UK have already embarked upon this journey and, and with the RED2 Renewable Energy Directive 2, the whole of the EU will be moving in this direction uh, from next year. And indeed we have similar kinds of incentive policies in, in the US. So the good news is that policy is now starting to promote the uh, uh, supply and, and, and the demand of, 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 of SAF. And then on the supply side, um, support in particular around new technologies to assist with the scale development to a high level of technological readiness is, is also important. This will help to create um, well, a couple of other things that we need to bear in mind here is that the, the policy should be ideally agnostic of which technology, let the technologies that are the most effective uh, win. Um, we, they should obviously promote sustainable uh, uh, SAF, in other words, feedstocks, which truly are helping to reduce the, the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, 
and, and ultimately promote a level playing field as far as possible. So we've talked about availability and sustainability. We've talked about the affordability or cost issue and how policy can help bridge the gap. If I now look at um, the outlook going forward for sustainable aviation fuel, there are different uh, production pathways or technologies that can be deployed. Right now, we are uh, seeing uh, significant growth, not just from Neste, but from other players in investing in the um, supply of so-called HEFA, SAF, that's hydrogenated, hydro-processed esters and fatty acids, but fundamentally it's the kind of fuel that George was referring to earlier that is available in Europe and, and North America. That can supply probably up to 10% of global demand. And when I say 10%, that was pre-COVID, so it would probably be 20% of current demand levels. But we are also, as an industry, working on um, technologies to allow the production of SAF from wastes, from non-food crops, um, so municipal solid waste from non-food crops and other, lign other lignocellulosic um, raw materials. These are effectively bio-based uh, materials um, that we are recycling. And then the, the real game changer in the very long term is to use renewable uh, power to um, um, create hydrocarbons from water and carbon captured from the atmosphere or from industrial emissions, so-called power to liquids or e-fuels. There, the technology has still got a long way to go and Needless to say, these future technologies not only are less ready, but they cost more. So, so what we need to achieve is a means by which we can grow the availability of SAF with the currently uh, commercially available uh, uh, production methods, whilst at the same time working on, on, on the future technologies to, 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 to ultimately deliver what was referred to earlier, the use of SAF uh, to, to, to to a very high degree in, in, the, in the overall consumption of aviation fuel in the industry. So in summary, we have multiple solutions here, both for SAF, but also for um, the industry in terms of deploying not just SAF, but also other aircraft technologies to reduce emissions very significantly. The industry is aligned and so let's get going. The, 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 we're on the runway, we're ready to take off. We have it available today. We know what the technologies are that we want to scale up. We need now the policy to help provide the demand and demand certainty for the investment. And, 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 and we also need as an industry, as has been referred to earlier, to collaborate and cooperate together because as an industry, we can solve this we can truly make a difference and achieve a much, much lower carbon aviation travel. So thank you very much. I think that uh, completes Thanks, my Thanks, quick man. outline on the availability of SAF. So back to you, Costas. Thanks, Jonathan, for this optimistic note at the end. Uh, we'll move, move quickly to um, uh, Laurent uh, Morel the, he's from Total. He's the Senior Vice President of European Public Affairs. Um, Laurent, your, the floor is yours. So thank you, Costis. Minister, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, thank you for remaining with us at this late time. And thank you to the organizing committee for providing us with the opportunity to share our views. I will try to be efficient and thank you, Jonathan, for having made my life easier because I'm not going to repeat, just to emphasize a part of what you just said. So just a quick word on Total first, uh, and a reminder that uh, we announced last year our ambition to get to net zero. Uh, so you can see there are three objectives within this ambition. Uh, for the audience who is not familiar with the notion of scope one, two, and three, Scope one is direct emissions. When we uh, use a gas turbine, we emit CO2. Scope two is indirect emissions. When we buy electricity, depending on the way electricity is made, we import, in a way, uh, some emissions. And scope three is also indirect emission, but this time, when we sell kerosene to an airline, 
emissions are when the kerosene is burned within the plane and therefore with the airline, but it's still part of our scope three. So you can see that our objective for Europe, because the European society is ready for it, is to go to net zero, scope one, two, and three. So all of it by 2050 or sooner. And then we have also worldwide objectives, but in the, in the interest of time, I'm not going to comment them further. And when we come to aviation, we do see decarbonizing air transport as a way of offering new opportunities for SAF. It has been said before by Mr. Govatsidakis about the airlines making commissions. It has been commented, I'm not going to go further on it. And Jonathan provided a very good view of uh, mandates having been already passed or being discussed for Europe. Uh, and you do see the 50% emission that was already achieved by AGN at this point in time from the curve that, that was shown earlier. So if I move toward what we are doing, we clearly intend to becoming a leader in renewable diesel, and this is true also. For uh, and, and the issue of affordability has been discussed. So the way we do it is by trying to be efficient. If you go for greenfield developments, you will probably be in a range of about, above $1,000 per ton. So what we do is we convert existing assets. We did it for the Lamed refinery in the south of France, which is now a bio refinery. We announced in September that we are going to convert the traditional Grand Puy refinery near Paris into a zero platform with the production of biofuels, bioplastics, uh, plastic chemical recycling together with some solar facilities. And in Grand Puy, we are going to produce 400,000 tons per year of biofuels, including biojet. And we do this as a cost which is in the range of 600 to 750 dollars per ton, so significantly less compared with the greenfield development. So you can see the interest in uh, using existing assets where we can reuse some facilities. We also go for co-processing. We have plans uh, starting in the coming years for 300,000 tons per year in Europe. So co-processing, again, for the audience, is the ability to process a blend of traditional oil together with uh, bio and low-carbon uh, uh, feedstocks that we can process together, therefore the name co-processing. Uh, we also evaluate a project in the US, and when you look at this, we are this time in a, in, in, in a magnitude of about $500 per ton of investment. So you can see it's uh, half compared with uh, a greenfield development. And we are also looking at developing new facilities on the existing platform, and this time we have it in South Korea. And again, you can see that each time we are looking at minimizing investment because it's a key component in ensuring affordability for future supply. You can see that we target uh, 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 about 5 million tons per year in 10 years from now in 2030. A very large uh, capacity increase. If we, if we want to summarize, uh, we need for the aviation sector to decarbonize was clear. How to substitute also made clear. And, and there was a point about dropping and using infrastructure. Uh, clearly, SAF do not require changes in existing infrastructures or aircrafts. So when, when you look at the global cost along the value chain of decarbonizing aviation, we believe SAF have a very good advantage there. It was said before, there won't be, in our opinion, any silver bullet. 
so we do see such solutions as a mix of technological developments. So we are talking advanced biofuels, we are talking synthetic fuels, we are talking synthetic fuels based on hydrogen, and always guaranteeing that we do have strict sustainability criteria. Uh, I was looking at the previous slide and you can see that uh, we are going to concentrate our efforts on basically the three same routes, EFA, available today, uh, other pathways, and we are focusing on alcohol to jet and fissure trucks, uh, an all-time technology with these challenges, but uh, R&D is, uh, is there to help, and for longer term e-fuels. Just a quick word about uh, global research and development in total. We, we invest about a billion a year in R&D at group level. And this uh, innovation effort has been refocused massively on zero carbon and low carbon technology. It's true for aviation, but it's true for all our activities, basically. So as you can see, we aim at becoming a leader. I talked about Grand Puy. Grand Puy is going to produce 170,000 tons per year of sustainable aviation fuels by 2024. On policy, the issue of cost was mentioned at least three to four times higher. When you come to e-fuels, it might be more like five to six times with current uh, technology level. Does require a proper regulation. We have the view that the market for SAF could exceed 200 million tons by 2050, which is about 40% of the jet fuel market. So a very large part of it. And if we want to achieve uh, neutrality by 2050, we are clearly of the view that a significant uptake of SAF should take place in the next 10 years. And we share the same view with Neste that the demand side is very important and should drive the number of regulation and therefore the uptake in the development of SAF production. In terms of geography, uh, clearly aviation is, is a worldwide uh, area. So in theory, uh, a worldwide regulation is the most efficient to ensure level playing field and uh, make sure that there is no distortion of, uh, of competition. This being said, uh, we are of the view that given the current reality of the world, a regulatory intervention is proper now at the EU level, uh, where we can have things moving uh, while Globally, the world uh, decides what can be done jointly. So clearly, uh, we welcome uh, the refuel EU aviation. We also welcome the fuel EU maritime that was mentioned by uh, earlier speakers. Uh, also, the Commissioner for Transport has announced the formation of an EU alliance for renewable and low carbon fuels. So this is very welcome. Uh, all these biofuels, advanced biofuels, e-fuels are part of a large family that we can describe as a low carbon liquid fuels and which we believe is very relevant to addressing climate challenges. And maybe just one last point. Uh, <clears throat> we are of the view that there is a question that EU authorities have to decide and which is whether the priority is to wait for advanced biofuels, at least there are availability in large quantities, or to start with sustainable biofuels, what we call for experts uh, of uh, Brussels, the Renewable Energy Directives Annex 9D, uh, that would allow an immediate emission reduction and prepare the sector for future of take of, of SAF. So for us, it's a, it's a question that, uh, that has to be addressed at European level. I tried to keep it short. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for. 
Thanks, uh, Lauren. Essentially, I have you on the floor. I, I want to start with, I mean, you said it's likely that, uh, uh, I mean, it is likely that there's a price cap will uh, remain for some time between uh, SAF and conventional fuel and, f and co conventional fossil kerosene. Uh, by whom would this price uh, gap be born? I mean, in your view? Uh, I think it is a very relevant question. Uh, the issue of acceptability and affordability is key. Uh, it's very clear that each citizen in Europe is also a consumer, and a large number of European citizens are air passengers. So how much do they pay at the end of the day is clearly a critical question for them. So I might not be popular, but our view is clearly that uh, the user of the service should pay for the cost. So in our view, the air passenger should pay the additional uh, cost. So after you heard three to four times more expensive, I sense that some people in the audience are starting to, be, to believe that uh, uh, it's too late for me in the day to speak. So let's look at it with another angle. Our estimate is that if you replace today 1%, 1% of traditional, traditional fossil fuels by itself, you increase the cost of a flight between Paris and New York. So I guess it's going to be about the same from Athens to New York by about five euros. So when you look at the number 5% that was shown, 5% times five euros, it's 25 euros. So is it acceptable to pay 25 euros more to fly from Europe to New York for the benefit of uh, climate? Our view is that it is, but obviously the answer is uh, for everyone to, to give. I'd, I'd like to cost us just build on that. I think, um, yes, our incentives can help in the short term, give some impetus to this. But at the end of the day, the user pays and, and, and mandates will encourage the user to pay. And I agree 100% with what Lance said in terms of the cost of this. It's a uh, 10% would still be you know, on a European flight, um, five to 10 euros. Are we willing to pay that? That's the cost of the carbon. It sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Yes, indeed. And I think as passengers become more uh, conscious about the reduction of CO2, I mean, they will gladly pay for it if it's, you know, stated very clearly and, uh, you know, it contributes to the low carbon mm -hmm. society. And especially, you know, in, here in Europe, where, you know, people are becoming very conscious. And especially after COVID, it appears like there is uh, an increased awareness about uh, reducing um, carbon emissions. Um, there's a question from our audience, and I, I don't know. I mean, I guess Mr. Kovacidak, since you know you're from Aegean, could answer it, or you know anybody else. Uh, could we have airplanes that have electric engines? I mean, this is an obvious question. Sure. Is the sound okay? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, as I mentioned also before in the presentation, and in fact, uh, I, I showed that I think the technologies uh, associated with electric aircraft are still far away. Uh, and uh, I don't know if the particular question was referring, for example, to battery equipped aircraft uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, electric aircraft. Uh, the main problem, and you might have seen in my presentation as well, uh, is weight. And um, uh, we are very constrained by what we can carry on the aircraft. Uh, the So I think in terms of electric aircraft powered by batteries, uh, the, uh, the weight of the batteries that you have to carry in order to reach the uh, energy output currently that we have with a gas turbine and even more so with the gas turbine running on SAF uh, would be prohibitive, I think. Uh, there is also a very um, um, 
graphic uh, <laughs> statistic that I like to share with you uh, in terms of the power consumption of batteries. Uh, you can, uh, and quoted by, by one of my former advisors in the past, Alan Epstein, and Alan said, you can power an A380 for half an hour using batteries, using all the state power of the state of California, of sorry, of uh, Connecticut in the US, which is not very small. Uh, that's only for half an hour for an A380 type of aircraft, right? So we can uh, immediately, I think, understand that these technologies are quite far out. Obviously, we never rule out any new developments, disruptive technologies that could take place uh, in this area. But uh, at the moment, I think the benefits from such technologies are not easily realizable. Uh, there's another question from our audience. I think uh, Mr. Pateras may be the one who, uh, uh, judging from your presentation, I think may be referring, referring to you. Uh, he says regarding the ferry project in Greece, if he's not mistaken, the cost which is 11 billion, which will be the source of financing of such project? Will it be EU funds, it's other sources? Uh, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, we're currently in the process of um, getting funding for the business plan, which will basically tell us how the funding will come in. Our uh, first investigations show that it will be self-financing, the funds that each of the um, ferryboat companies have. There'll be bank financing, uh, obviously. There will be funding from the Agones Grames or the public offering that uh, for the... Um, uh, islands that have few passengers, there will be EU funding and there will also be investment. It, it can't happen without having outside investors into this captive market. I hope I've answered the question, but I can't tell you percentages because we're still in the process of uh, doing the business plan. But that's basically the idea. The funding will not come from either EU funding solely or from Greek government funding solely or from uh, the banks. It has to be a... Um, mixed sort of funding thank you okay um there's also another question it says biofuels even when quasi carbon neutral still emit other pollutants heavily regulated and cannot conform to for example uh, you know the low uh, uh, no uh, limits how would you propose to overcome the controversy especially when these fuels are used also for electricity generation um i guess they were referring also in you know in the, in the shipping industry or um uh, is anybody who would in, in the panel who well, there's not a specific person who um, uh, this question is directed to regarding biofuels? Steve, sorry, could I hear the last part of the question again? Because I didn't get the the last part of the question. Uh, how do you propose to overcome the controversy, especially when these fuels are also used for electricity generation? You're talking about biofuels. That uh, biofuels, even uh, when quasi carbon neutral, they still emit heavily a lot of pollutants. Um, I think I think the question has two parts. The one is 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 the actual makeup of the biofuels, and the other part is regarding the competition uh, for these biofuels. Um, uh, biofuels, the, the sustainable biofuels show a lot of promise and also we have to understand, and this is uh, uh, something which we probably didn't make as clear as we, we should, that um, it's, it's, it's often that the biofuels which are suitable for the airline industry uh, are not necessarily the same ones uh, suitable for the shipping industry or the power generation industry. Uh, shipping and power generation uh, tend to use the same uh, level of technology or the same type of uh, 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 machinery, whether it's uh, 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 internal combustion engine or a, or a, or a gas turbine. So uh, what is, what, uh, is uh, uh, from, from the point of view of competing with the power generation industry, of course, this is of great concern in shipping because we we obviously will get a, a second bite at the cherry uh, because the power generation industry has a greater politi political constituent uh, than we do uh, in uh, shipping. 
Now, regarding the actual regarding the actual biofuels themselves, the the chemical makeup, um, there are many many types of biofuels. Uh, some of the biofuels, um, uh, um, and and some of these which are uh, suitable for shipping and power generation, actually produce more nitrogen oxide than equivalent fossil fuel. And in that respect, we have to take uh, uh, special uh, measures. But the way, the way that the biofuel market hopefully will be structured going forward, it has to be, it has to be looked at in a very positive manner. Um, a lot of these biofuels are, are, are from biomass. A lot of these biofuels are industrial wastes. Um, and, and therefore, we have to look at this in a very, very positive manner. And um, uh, we, we, we will be solving other problems by combusting uh, these uh, biofuels. Uh, just as an example, and, and I'll give you a, 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 a and, and some of you will remember this, and I think it still goes on. In the United States, if you buy marine diesel, marine diesel in the United States is still, you're, the, uh, it's still allowed by the American authorities to have 5% used lube oils in marine diesel, even today, I believe. Uh, certainly, that was the case historically. So um, on the one hand, you know, basically the United States was exporting its pollution, but I think that that's what we're going to be doing um, on a worldwide basis now. Uh, that's the reality. Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually, this was the last question from the audience. And um, I think we cover all the, the angles. I, I mean, it was a very interesting panel. Uh, and I think this is something we can soon repeat. I mean, definitely uh, green fuels for the future um, are going to be developing very fast. And especially as you know, the EU uh, um, advances its green deal, um, there will be a lot of for the developments. I want to thank Iane and Costis for organizing this session. And of course, there are all this, this very high level panel. Um, I learned a lot of things today. And I think um, each of you individually, I might contact later for my stories. I think it was very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, Costis, yeah, you can wrap up. Thanks a lot again for uh, inviting okay. us. And, uh, thank you. Thank you, Costis, for managing this session very expertly as usual. Uh, uh, Liana is going to take the floor now. She wants to say a few things as the uh, chairman of the downstream committee and really the chairwoman of this conference. So Liana, you, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Costis. Uh, well, uh, I would like, on behalf of the Hydrocarbons Downstream Committee of FNA, I would like to thank all our distinguished speakers for their great contribution to this debate on green fuels of the future, uh, a debate that we opened uh, today, yesterday and today here in Greece with this uh, Today conference. And of course, I would like to thank all attendees for staying with us until this time of the day. Uh, I would say that this is just the beginning of this debate. As we heard from our speakers during those two days, transformation has started, but there is a long way ahead and uh, it requires full speed from today and onwards. So I would close by saying, uh, uh, let us stay tuned on this discussion and let us be part of it in order to enable all major changes that will be needed. Thank you very much. Okay, right. So, thank you, Liana, and thank thank everybody, especially the speakers um, who actively participated, very well prepared, all of them. And um, I would like to say, uh, summing up, that we had uh, an input from all the parties who play a role in this affair, which is the political leadership. We had the um, representatives of the companies, the trade bodies. We had Fuel Europe, UPIE. We had Hydrogen Europe, the Alliance of Energy Intensive Industries, the Hellenic Association of Oil Market Companies. So all the uh, important trade bodies, uh, representatives of the industry were here with very concrete proposals. And in addition, we were lucky to have um, representatives of most of the major uh, energy industries, oil industries, now they're calling themselves energy industries, including Hellenic Petroleum, Motor Oil, Elin Oil, 
BP, um, Neste, um, Repsol, OMV, Total, AGN Alliance. Uh, I hope I didn't um, omit somebody, but I think all of them were there. And of course, at the end, we had the most important, one of the most important sectors uh, in uh, of our um, businesses, as far as Greece is concerned, which is shipping. And we have two heavyweights, Mr. Papalios and Mr. Pateras, uh, very well versed, both of them, uh, in the fuels um, of the future, the fuels that are going to change the, the world, as we know. And we're really thankful to all of them for putting so much effort and time in this. I think we have all become wiser attending even one of the sessions of this conference. From our side, as ENF, uh, what we're going to do over the next few days, we're going to contact each speaker to get their uh, confirmation that uh, an approval that we can use the content. In a microsite, we're preparing for the conference. So in a few days, um, a link will come to you with, uh, which will be the microsite of the conference with most, all of most of the presentations. And uh, that will be very useful as a reference tool uh, to be able to assess the situation. Concluding, I would like to say that based, based on the success of this event, what we would like to do as an institute is try at least once a year to have such a gathering uh, of experts and industry to assess the situation, come up with proposals, and try to be useful in this fast moving um, uh, sector. So once again, thank you very much all for participating and I look forward to meeting you in one of our future events. Goodbye. Thank you.